Today we're here to discuss, will technology put an end to disability? And if you're going to tweet along with us, please use the hashtag tech and disability and spelled out because we learned this week that ampersands do not work with hashtags. Our event today was inspired by the award-winning documentary on disability and technology, Fixed, the science slash fiction of human enhancement. Director Reagan Brashear was unfortunately unable to join us today, but I believe that she'll be watching the live stream with us. And incidentally, speaking of the live stream, um, when you have a question to ask, please wait for the microphone to come so that the sound can make it onto the live stream. Um, our first panel today is going to be Engineering Ability and will be moderated by Slate Senior Technology writer Will Ramis. But first, let's enjoy the trailer for Fixed. Who wants to have um, a jetpack to fly around? Me. Yeah. Who wants to have um, special robot legs that make you go faster? No, you don't want that. Only Zachary wants that. Only Zachary wants that. Who wants? I a, want that. A, a, I want that. You want that? Yeah. You want that? Who would want um, another eye? Do you want to turn into a? Eye? Oh yeah, I want, I want. I want three eyes in the back of my head, but they're covered in hair. What do you think humans need? What do you think humans need oh, to I improve have. them? A female marine veteran has become the world's first true bionic woman. We're already part artificial, aren't we? If there were a drug that would make you smarter, would you take is it? Is the quest for a perfect baby morally wrong? The sprinter is running with prosthetic legs faster than most people in the world. It will redefine the field. We're used to a certain amount of artificiality, but this is taking it to a full yeah, level. It's happening now. What does it mean when you can augment the mind, if you can improve memory? What does it mean if you could augment the body? In the future, emerging genetic technologies coupled with assisted reproductive technologies could give us the capacity to design enhanced children, which causes concerns about creating genetic casts and superhumans. There have been so many advances, even in the past few years, that I think people are aware how more aware at least, how quickly the technologies are moving. Us humans, especially us baby boomers, are really going to want augmentation pretty soon. As we start to decay, we're going to be demanding more and more augmentation. I'd like to have a better memory, maybe with memory chips or something. I probably want to be taller so I can play for the NBA. I just turned 50, so memory is like sort of an issue. I'm happy who I am. I actually don't need anything. I mean, if I could fly, maybe it would be okay. Am I disabled? It depends which definition we use. Of course I'm a disabled person. Do I see myself as an impaired person? No. I'm just who I am. There's all kind of dynamics which goes around this obsession with ability and competitiveness and that the only way to get respect is if you show you're superior to someone else. Ableism is our obsession with certain abilities and the accompanying negative treatment of people who don't have these kind of abilities. Human enhancement is no different than human. Everything from brain implants to spinal cord injury, rehab, to cell phones to gaming. There, there is no difference between them. What if this kind of collaboration with a machine was flexible enough to allow the user to do whatever they want with it? You want to make a device that has an, a sophisticated enough collaboration that that human will make it an arm in their own way, in their own image. My artificial limbs are now part of my body. They're part of my identity now. What I'd like to see is the death of normalcy. What is normal to you? I thought I was normal before my injury. I certainly still feel normal today. I really don't understand the desire for enhancement technologies. We don't have basic health care, not only in this country, but globally. Preventable diseases are like number one killers globally. 
Talk about misplaced priorities. It is like this huge irony that the research money that goes into emerging technologies as opposed to wheelchairs that are waterproof. <laughs> that demonstrates the financial priorities for the healthcare system. Wheelchairs are amazing, and that's really precious, and at the same time, it's a machine. You know, I'm, I'm subject to its um, frailties, you know, like any machine. So it makes me feel pretty vulnerable. Where are the hand controls? Yeah, you hear the hand controls? All right. People should think of disability as another human experience. All right, ready? That embodies qualities of human adaptability that are common to all people, whether they have a specific disability or not. And the experiences of people with disabilities have lessons for the population at large. Technologies that help bring people up to normal are used to help people go beyond normal. Often when I talk about implants to people, they say, oh, that's too icky. No one would do that willingly. No one would have a, a cochlear implant if they weren't deaf, if they didn't need it. No one would have a, a, a visual implant if they didn't need it. And I say to them, Botox. People will do anything to their bodies for, for, for enhancement, social enhancement. If you force me to see myself as deficient and you want me to enhance myself to your level, then I, of course, will say no. I go further and then you are deficient because I outdo you. I mean, why would I want to have legs which only get me to your level? Every line we draw will be, will be, will be transgressed in the next you know, 10, 20, 30, 50 years. And, and we are going to see more and more augmentations, alterations of our body as the technologies develop. These genetic technologies assume that human variation along a spectrum of ability should be eliminated. We have these technological developments, they're not inevitable, but they do have a lot of momentum behind them. And so we, at this point in human history, we're at this moment where we have to, where it's our responsibility to really look at them carefully and really make decisions. Stage, uh, Larry Jasinski, the CEO of Rewalk Robotics, and Jennifer Fren French, the executive director of Neurotech Network. Given the time when we're seeing headlines about technology related to disability that sound like they're straight out of science fiction. You hear about uh, a uh, paralyzed man taking the first cup at the world, uh, taking the world first kick at the World Cup with a bionic leg. Uh, you hear about there was a story just the other day about a woman uh, flying an F-15 flight simulator using only her mind. Um, it sounds borderline miraculous. It's real. There are limitations. Technology is progressing very quickly. And we want to talk a little bit about, a little bit today about where the technology is today, what miraculous things we can already do, what seemingly miraculous things we'll be able to do in the future, and what the implications are of a world in which technology can allow us to overcome a lot of the disabilities that we have today. Um, and first, I want to let our panelists talk a little bit about themselves, tell you about their background, uh, and uh, I think you'll enjoy uh, hearing what they do and their stories. Larry, uh, tell us what Rewalk Robotics does. Sure. Rewalk Robotics, uh, our goal is simply to provide a device that allows people that are either paralyzed or have other impairments the ability to walk once again. And I would characterize us as, at this stage, after many years of science, or more at the applications level. 
uh, we are providing this now and, and working to get it provided to large numbers of people, paid for, trained, and everything else. On a personal end, I have uh, spent 30 years of my life doing medical devices. And this is a culmination that has led me from doing implants to something that fits on the outside of the body that the individual can interact with and decide when they want to stand up, decide when they want to take a step, stop, turn, where they want to go talk, or if they want to stand up and put their arms around somebody, give them a hug. So it's, it's a uh, wonderful technology to be associated with. That's incredible. So when people ask you what you do for a living, you say, I help paralyzed people walk again. Yeah, I do, and uh, I get some great responses. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you said that, if you said that a, a few centuries ago, you might have gotten uh, some uh, more hostile responses. <laughs> I probably would have been uh, burned at a stake or something, I think. <laughs> exactly. Um, Jennifer, tell us uh, about what you do at Neurotech Network and, and also a little bit about your background. and advocacy of neurotechnology devices. So the, really the, the, the industry definition of neurotechnology is medical electronics that interact with the human nervous system. So common devices, probably some of the more common devices, are things like cochlear implants uh, for the hearing impaired, deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's disease, and spinal cord stimulation for chronic pain. But there's a whole plethora of technologies that are out there that are they're able to give people with neurological conditions new functions. And what our nonprofit does is try to raise the awareness of not only the consumer, the caregiver, and those frontline clinicians of what type of technologies are out there. So for fear of sounding like the hair club for men, um, I was spinal cord injured in 1998 and became a quadriplegic from a spinal cord injury due to a snowboarding accident. And um, about a year and a half after that, I received uh, a neural implant or a neural prosthetic. So I now have uh, electrodes implanted inside my body, right in the muscle tissue, some of them to the nerves, um, that are fully implanted inside the body. And I use this external device. This is not a bomb that I'm wearing around my waist. This is actually the um, external controller that uh, controls the device. So uh, people say, okay, well, you're in a wheelchair. What does it really do for you? Well, the, the, the technology was not designed to replace the wheelchair. It was designed to work with the wheelchair. So if uh, it's very simple to use. If you can see right now, I'm, uh, I have the technology. I just put it on. Of course, everything never happens the way technology that we want it to, doesn't it? So, needless to say, I crossed my wires, which we all do sometimes. So here, as you see, I just turned it on. It, it did, uh, contracted my back muscles. Normally, if I would be sitting, I would be sitting with my paralyzed muscles this way. If I turn it on, just simply, it sends high-level radio frequencies to the implanted device. With it turning on, I'm able to stand out of my wheelchair using my own muscles. Um, and, and my own volition. So this is, allows me to stand up by the wheelchair to move short distances, to be able to make transfers that I normally wouldn't be able to do. But I'm also able to turn it off at a moment's notice and be able to come back into my wheelchair and be paralyzed with my muscles were before. So really when I was implanted with this device, um, it was very exciting, but there was also, I met a lot of other people that use these types of neurotechnology devices, and they're not aware, and they had to search to try to find them, and that's why we started Neurotech Network. That's wonderful. Um, and Larry, can you tell me a, a little bit about what's different about the technology that you build at Rewalk? Well, the idea of building something to allow someone to walk is not a new one. It's a dream. I could find a publication in 1948 about large motor assemblies that uh, would allow someone to walk. Uh, what's different is three or four things have changed over the last decade and they're going to continue to move. Battery technology is much better to give an ability to power something sufficiently. Uh, software has developed and uh, the computer capacity to make software mimic exact human walking uh, has come along and then sensor technologies. So if, if uh, you took a rewalk device and you were sitting in a chair, you would literally set a wrist controller on, okay, I want to stand. It won't do anything until you do this motion. If you go out of a chair like this, you're going to fall back in. It's just this normal forward motion. And when you're walking, it's the same thing. Each step forward, uh, you do enough movement of your shoulder, the sensor will tell the software to take the next step. Uh, so the technology has become very friendly. It can't work by itself. The walk, walk person can't walk by themselves. When you combine the two, you have an interface that allows someone to independently 
decide where, when, and how they're going to walk. And so you don't actually need an implant for your technology to work? No, ours is strictly worn on the outside of the body. I think uh, right now it comes out about five centimeters on each side with the motors and gears. Uh, and then there's a waste pack and, uh, which holds the thing together and a battery pack that has two batteries and a computer on it. I think uh, if you want to look down the road somewhere, this gets to a much more miniaturized system. It's going to be like cell phones. The original cell phones were this big, and then, then they got smaller, now they're getting bigger again. But uh, we don't plan on the getting bigger again part, but I, I think you'll see this eventually as something that could be worn under the clothes uh, and almost put on like a pair of pants. But he, he touched on something that's really important is the battery power. I mean, if you go to any airport, we're all tethered to the walls right now, right? So we all need that battery power. But Battery power is really a nemesis of this technology, particularly for even implanted devices. When you think of um, implanted uh, defibrillators, people have to get them replaced. And how do we improve that, that battery technology so that we don't have to have implanted batteries replaced and we're able to recharge them inside the body? And they're able to last for a longer period of time. Yes. So it's not a matter of having to carry spare batteries with us, that the user becomes very used to having that type of power with them and they can really rely on that technology instead of being concerned about that battery power. I think we're all learning from the battery side. Uh, the hardest challenge I had with this early on is shipping batteries is effective because people worry about the size and there's, there's a lot of restrictions that have arisen off some of the airline industry in particular. So we've had to design to, for the practical reality of if you're going on a flight, we've got to have something you could take on the plane with you. And we presently are defining uh, adequate battery power as you can do four hours of constant walking because people stop and start, and that seems to meet our product definition or goal was all day use. Uh, but uh, as you enhance that power, A, we can go faster, uh, B, you'll be able to go up those stairs more easily uh, and, and use it more uh, for longer periods of time. Uh, but we also have to be able to get it to where the person is uh, and deal with the airlines and everybody else because there's a fear of batteries in, uh, in interacting with other parts of uh, the market. Yeah, and, and uh, let's well, let's also talk about some of the other limitations of the technology because it's so easy. It's so easy to just read the headlines and think, oh, every everything is solved, uh, you know, um, and it's all magic. Um, in fact, there are you know there there are still real obstacles um, in a lot of the technologies that are uh, uh, helping people overcome their dis disabilities. Um, batteries are one of them. Um, you probably have heard of, heard about Moore's law for computer processors. Um, the idea that, that computer processors uh, uh, progress in terms of size and speed exponentially rather than, uh, rather than linearly, that has not been the case so far with battery technology. Um, we, it's, it's advancing, it's coming along, um, but it's not, you know, not going to uh, happen overnight. Um, what are some of the other limitations, uh, Jennifer, of the technology that you use? Yeah, well, not only the technology that I use, I think one of the biggest limitations of this type of technology that we're talking about is us, is that you know our systems, our frameworks, our structures are not set up to be able to very easily translate this technology from the laboratory to the consumer, to who they're intended. So for instance, the translation from the lab to the consumer is known as the valley of death when it comes into to the world of technology because not many of them are, be, are as successful as Larry has been to be able to take that technology out of the laboratory and bring it to the consumer from a business perspective. So when we look at, the, I'll give you some prime examples, when we look at standard of care, for instance, let's say rehabilitation for stroke, those standards of care are very difficult to try to change in terms of how we treat people that are stroke survivors. We need to change those standards of care so that they integrate the technology with them. When we look at our reimbursement systems, how do we look at reimbursement systems? Because that's the world that we live in and how we pay for medical care. How do we make those reimbursement systems be able to, to be fluid enough to be able to look at this technology and see the enhancements? But I think it's a two-sided story. How do we bring down the cost of the technology, but also how do we open up those standards of care so people can get access to them? Yeah, that's, um, that's a really important point, and, and I want to get into that a little more later on. Um, Larry, can you tell me, your product, the Rewalk uh, products, are not for everyone, right? Right. The, the Rewalk, uh, we fall into some of the categories when you're designing a product and you're trying to do an end, end point of commercialization. Uh, you have to work within certain boundaries, and you start really with a marketing spec where you define, here's what we want a product to do, all day use, uh, that it can be used independently, uh, and that translates further downstream into what the technical uh, capacities are. And, and presently for a rewalk, it is limited to what we proved with the FDA first, and then also what we've given data to the reimbursers so that they'll pay for it. So 
We are limited in uh, height from about five foot two to about six foot two. We're limited to no more than 100 kilos or about 220 pounds. Um, and that gets a large percentage of the audience. Um, but there, there are also further things and, uh, if for individuals in use that uh, we can continue to develop the technology for. Uh, but right now it hits uh, a limited population that was driven more by the technical elements of application. Again, uh, what I, I can only sell it for what I proved the FDA was safe. And those are my boundaries right now. And how much does it cost? Uh, price right now is $70,000 uh, in the United States, roughly 52,000 euros. Uh, I think I'd hit cost on a different a variety of different planes. We, we did pricing when we looked at other products that were uh, and technologies that were out there. Uh, from a practical point of view, we looked a little bit at cost of goods. Uh, but we also looked quite a bit at, okay, what offer, what do we offer to the reimbursement community, the insurance community? And this is the data that we have to continue to develop and think of in terms of pricing from a practical point of view. If, if I can show a reduction in medications, I'll give an example. One of our users that is walking all the time now took two Oxycontins a day and took uh, Percocet uh, when he couldn't have any more Oxycontin. It also made him live in his bed and somewhat depressed all the time. He's been walking for about a year. He hasn't taken Oxycontin in now over a year. Uh, and his wife will tell us that, okay, he's, you've given me my husband back. He's back in my life. But from a practical point of view, I could take every drug he's no longer taking and calculate about ten or $12,000 a year in savings. And then I can look at what has happened to people with spinal cord injury with some frequency. Urinary tract infection is very common. Uh, pressure sores are not unusual. To treat a pressure sore in an American hospital uh, is an event that costs on average $79,000. So when we took the other side of that and looked at complications avoided, we feel that number is about 15 to 18,000 based on the data from the clinical study so far. That's data we have to keep building, but we're showing a cost savings of about 30,000 a year in other health benefits. Uh, so the device pays for itself in about two and a half years. And that is the argument we're trying to make to the reimbursement community. And we have good data, we need more data. Because right now your insurance won't cover it, right? Uh, the insurance right now in the United States is case by case. Uh, we've had a number starting to be covered. Uh, we've had the Veterans Administration cover it for veterans that are service-related injury out of the James J. Peters in the Bronx. They did that on the, based on their own data. So if you're a veteran who's paralyzed, uh, you can go to that particular hospital and, and get a system. Uh, we have seen the workman's compensation side uh, somewhat active in looking at this for people that were injured in a, a work-related. Uh, but now they review it on a case-by-case -case basis and make decisions. We're still in the single numbers of the numbers that have been approved. Uh, but we're really, our FDA clearance was last June. We're about six months into it. One of the things you get back to, I uh, say I'd rather talk more about the engineering and the design, uh, but I've hired a reimbursement team, uh, people that have expertise in this. And when someone who's paralyzed needs help, we help with the med letter of medical necessity, we help uh, provide the data so the insurers can properly consider it. Mm -hmm. And that's a reality that we have to do because our Dr. Gopher, the guy who invented this, uh, is a remarkable story in himself. He's a quadriplegic and he had a vision that people could walk, but that was everybody that needed to walk. It wasn't the wealthy. And, and that is a little bit of uh, why we have to do the reimbursement and the FDA components. So it's kind of a long answer to limitations. No, it's, it's a good answer. And, and the expense, I mean, the expense is, is always part of the issue when you're talking about cutting edge technology. Um, it's, it doesn't pay for itself. I mean, it maybe partly pays for itself. It doesn't pay for itself up, fr up front, certainly. Um, Jennifer, you, uh, through the Neurotech Network, you work with people all the time who are struggling with these issues, I assume, of you know, how do you afford this amazing technology that you read about in the paper. And some of it is uh, you know, there's a specific grant at a specific hospital where they're doing research and you have an opportunity to go in and do something on a trial basis. Um, when we look down the road, um, assuming that some of these technologies remain very expensive and also very powerful in what they're able to do, is it a human right for people to uh, be able to have uh, a technology that will allow them to uh, overcome uh, paralysis or, or other disabilities? Well, there's a lot of sides to that of a, of a human right, but I think Larry really touched on something really important is that for so much of the way that we look at healthcare or treating different types of neurological conditions, we become very myopic. We look at, oh, how is this person being treated in the next month, 30 days? 60 days, 90 days. The reality of it is is that a lot of these technologies, our bodies adapt to them and they take a while to see 
the true long-term results. So when we look at these longer-term studies and see what happens as we have neuroplasticity in the body, as the body adapts to this type of technology, we are actually improving people and we're starting to see those in those long-term studies. And that's what we need to do in terms of looking at whether this technology and people can benefit from it is instead of looking at these small windows is looking at how it, it interacts with us over a period of time. Does it become a human right? Well, when we look at it, I mean, I'm someone with a disability and I'm seeing the headlines just as much as you do and I want to be able to have access to them. But when I look at that, that dollar sign with it, it becomes inaccessible to a lot of people. We worked with one man a few years ago. Um, his wife had MS and uh, she was constantly tripping and not able to walk and she would have to be in a wheelchair. Well, they were able to see that she was able to benefit from something called a drop foot stimulator and be able to be mobile with that drop foot stimulator. He spent months fighting to get reimbursement because they were comparing a drop foot stimulator to what they called a walking stick or a common cane. Now when you look at the video of her being able to ambulate with a cane compared to a drop foot stimulator that is a very fluid movement, you can very easily see that she would be able to walk around downtown DC very easily, but with a cane she could probably only go a few blocks. So when we look at how people interact with the technology, is it a right to be able to get it? Well, I think we need to think of it that way. I think, Jen, your point, one thing I've learned is the importance of educating different groups. I learned it with the FDA as we went on and put a workshop on on exoskeletons because they were asking us questions that made no sense. Mm -hmm. But they were willing to learn. And what I'm finding, at least so far, I, I got a response from the guy, uh, I, I, I should quote him, but uh, he headed uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield up in uh, Pennsylvania. And he said, look, if, if I'm providing the technology for someone who's a mother of two and 30 years old, I've got to be thinking differently than when I'm providing it for someone who's 75 years old. So that's a judgment on its own, but that he was much more open to thinking about someone who has another 40 or 50 years of life ahead of them. What could I do that will really change it? Because the fundamentals of being able to exercise and do things again uh, has a long-term health impact. Right, and I don't mean to yeah. be completely negative, but yeah, yeah. we even had a, an FDA workshop um, where the FDA brought in a lot of people in this neurotechnology space where they're starting to look at how can we t change the way that we look at medical devices and be able to get them approved. We're starting to open those doors, but we're not there yet. We're not there yet. So, I mean, when we think about, for instance, um, some devices are approved by only those that are treatment resistant. So let's say a vagus nerve stimulator might be approved for depression, but it's only for those people that are treatment resistant. That means they've gone through all the other options that are currently available, and then they become a candidate. So we have to think about how we do that standard of care and how we think about how we care for people. That's one of the things we have to think of when we're getting them approved and going through the regulatory process. Yeah, yeah the saying that, that the future is already here, it's just unevenly distributed is, is uh, so often said in, uh, when, when, uh, in Future Tense forums and, and stories that uh, Tori Bosch, who edits Future Tense for Slate, has actually uh, banned it from, from uh, her section because you could say that about everything. But it really is, I mean, it really is true uh, when it comes to uh, some of the cutting edge technology that enables people uh, to overcome disabilities. Um, but let's talk a little bit more about what is possible. I mean, um, we, we, we've seen uh, what you can do. Um, we've heard a little bit about what Rewalk can do, but Jennifer, you also work with a lot of people who are using all sorts of different neurotechnology, um, not just to walk or to stand, but to do other things. Can you talk, maybe give, give two really cool examples of what else uh, neurotechnology can do? Yeah, well, I have 10 of them here in our book, actually. The uh, <laughs> Neurotech Network, we recently published Bionic Pioneers. It's a collection of 10 short stories of people with neurological conditions um, that use different types of technologies. And there's so many exciting stories out there right now. Um, it's MS Awareness Month, so uh, we featured a, a, a mother of seven who could no longer uh, be ambulatory to care for her kids due to MS, and uh, she got a drop foot stimulator, and she just recently uh, was up and dancing at her daughter's wedding. Um, there's, there's stories of an uh, of Army veteran who has ALS who decided to get a, a diaphragm pacing system to allow him to breathe on his own through his last days instead of being on a ventilator. Um, there's, there's stories of, of Kim O'Shea who, who lost her vision after the birth of her second child due to retina pigmentosa and she's now able to see using a retinal prosthesis. There's, there's these fantastic stories out there and um, these great technologies where we're making some great advances. I think the, the key thing, though, we have to think of as we're going into this frontier is we have to think about the user experience. 
And so how people interact with that technology, how we integrate it into our lives, is really something we haven't truly explored all that much. But we have to think about it as we design the technology. Right, maybe you can, you can address that a little bit. Well, I'll give a, a few uh, examples, I think. Uh, one starts with a gentleman who's a special operations marine in uh, Afghanistan, uh, Sergeant uh, uh, Derek Herrera. He got the first unit in the United States post-FDA approval. Um, when he first reached us, we told him he wasn't a candidate because he didn't really meet our inclusion criteria. But through his own motivation, he pursued and pushed this, and, and he went out of his way saying, look, I came into the military walking. I'm going to walk out of the military. And uh, we, we did provide the unit for him. Uh, he is someone who can walk uh, r r quite well these days. And on his retirement uh, ceremony this past November, he walked out of the military, which was a, uh, a great goal of his. And he's using it. In fact, he was here in Washington for the uh, Paralyzed uh, Veterans of America this week. So I got to see him some. The um, second one I'll use is a complaint I got, which is a kind of a, this is back to I'm the applications. I'm the practical side of the world for this point. Uh, one of our users, who was the first person to get one through the VA in the United States, uh, Sergeant Terry Hannigan, called me just two days ago and said, I have a problem that I've never had in recent years. And I said, okay, what, what the problem's not, product's not working? She goes, no, I have a hole in my shoe. I was walking, my foot was dragging, and I never had to replace my shoes before in my wheelchair. I didn't walk enough. And after walking uh, for the, uh, the past couple of years, she's put a hole in her shoe. So I agreed to buy our new pair of shoes. Uh, <laughs> but uh, those are great uh, stories. I, I'll use one other. It's a practical one. A mother of uh, two, a lady who has uh, lost one leg and is also, or lower leg, and is also paralyzed. Uh, she uh, went, uh, has had her system what, about eight months now, nine months now. Uh, and she wanted to take her daughter out trick-or-treating walking. So she dressed up as Catwoman wearing our suit. And the, her and her daughter went uh, trick-or-treating together this year in November. So th those are, when you ask me, uh, uh, they're miraculous in that the motivation of the individuals have gone on with their life in a meaningful way, and they're mundane in an extent, uh, going walking with your daughter, but it's, those are as, meaning, as meaningful as anything we do. Yeah, those, I mean, these stories are amazing. You know, people, people complain about uh, technology and you know, how our cell phones distract us and about how our, our kids are looking at screens all the time. I mean, this is the side of technology that just makes you go, wow. Like, you know, Thank goodness we live in the 21st century and, and you know, are able to do things like this. Um, the uh, topic of this panel, and, and the next panel is going to get into a little bit the idea of human enhancement, of, of going beyond trying to restore what, we, what some people would say are like normal or, or you know, sort of natural. These terms are very problematic, but normal and natural human abilities um, and uh, actually enabling people to do things that you could not possibly do without technology. Um, but the, the topic of this panel is, can technology put an end to disability? Um, I, you know, uh, that seems a long way off. Um, you know, it seems maybe a little far-fetched, but do we, would we even, would we want to put an end to disability? Is there anything, is there, is there anything that would be lost in a world where technology uh, has eliminated uh, disability entirely? Well, I, I will say this is, I'm, I'm a, big proponent of diversity, and I think diversity in our society is really important. Um, but when we look at technology and how people interact with it and how we overcome some of what we might call physical bar barriers or even, even mental barriers, um, when, when we think of that, right, we, um, we, we start to say, okay, well, how can we move forward and how can this technology change as we go, go into the future. So when we look at sensor technology that right now is allowing someone to ambulate, what if we're allowing somebody that's paralyzed to ambulate like a ballerina and make it very elegant? Then we might not look at paralysis as a disability. We might actually think of reading glasses as a disability. So we might have to redefine that disability as we move forward. Um, and as we look at the technology, sometimes we're looking at um, a lot of what's happening with the physical side, we demonstrated that today, of what's hap how we overcome some of these physical barriers. But what about when we talk about going into the brain? So now there's a lot of initiatives happening right now for us to help understand the brain and diseases of the brain, things like Alzheimer's, memory, uh, PTSD, concussions. When we start going into the brain, do we get concerned about enhancement? But what if we're able to treat these mental illnesses so much more effectively than we do today? What if we make mental illness and completely eradicate it because we're able to understand the brain better and we're able to use technology to overcome some of these barriers that we have today? 
I think I'd use the analogy of what we've done with uh, antibiotics and other things. We have changed the profile of, uh, and lifespan of people uh, in one level of health. Uh, for individuals with disability, uh, yes, it gives perspective and, and, and I think it helps us appreciate uh, for those of us that, that uh, uh, haven't experienced those types of things. And it also allows us to interact with people at a, in a different way and different level uh, that is a part of the human experience. Uh, but enhancing it uh, or providing technologies uh, that solve one, one thing will allow us to go other places. And I think as a society, uh, 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 we're going to see enhancements, and I, I would not find it unreasonable some of the stuff that you're working on combines with the stuff that we're working on because it will help more people and it will help them do things that uh, uh, we couldn't dream of today. Great. Uh, I wanted to see if there are any questions from the audience. Uh, if you have a question, maybe you can raise your hand, and I think, I think there's a mic that can be handed to you. Uh, Dave Oxter, uh, Research Institute for Independent Living. Uh, this question is about uh, transition of the technology to applied settings. Uh, back in 1948, there was an Academy Award uh, winning movie, Best Years of Our Lives, and it was about this uh, veteran who was a double amputee above the elbows, didn't have any hands, and uh, he was uh, adapting his life to ind independence in the community, and they had a, sh a, sh a shot in there where he was putting a wedding ring on his bride. I mean, that's how advanced the technology was. This was in 1948, and uh, 60 years later, you start to wonder, is that technology that was in 1948 being applied in the community today? You know, and if not, why isn't it? And that gets back into the transition of the technology into applied settings. Yeah, Larry, maybe that's a good question for you. I mean, why isn't this already ubiquitous? It's technologically possible. Uh, I think uh, there are, even for what we do, there are publications I can go back to, 19, 1948, I think it was a Yugoslavia paper, that talked about mechanical things that could allow someone the ability to walk once again. Uh, the, uh, the advent of motors and gears and assemblies, that's been around for a while. What didn't exist uh, in, in, and didn't really exist until the last 10 years, the three things that enabled what we are able to offer uh, to uh, the community uh, are uh, dramatic improvements in battery technology, so it can last all day. We talked a little bit about that. Uh, computing technology and software um, has made a big difference because we can mimic human walking so you can do things. We've had people do a 10K event in these. Uh, at this stage, uh, and uh, the uh, improvement of sensing technology where they can control it independently. Uh, and those are technologies that are newer, uh, all less than 10 years uh, for, for any of those at a level that we have. I, I would say the first unit I saw Dr. Gopher, who is a quadriplegic, the gentleman who invented this, in around uh, 2001, I think it was, uh, they were pushing along a cart with a desktop computer and monitor on it as the computing technology behind it. And uh, you know, at this point, we've got it down to something that's, that's pretty small. Um, so I, I think what you saw or what we've seen from the movies, you can do a lot with movies because you can change camera angles and do other things. When you're trying to actually put it in someone's kitchen or in someone's workplace, uh, there's a lot of practical stuff we have to do. But I think you touched on something really important there is that um, you know, we have some exciting research going on today. And, and really the US is one of the leaders in the world when it comes to this type of neurotechnology. Um, and we have the Brain Initiative. We have lots of funding from the NIH and DARPA that's helping us to explore this technology and move it forward. Where we haven't put those resources is the translation to the consumer. And that's what you're seeing today. And that's what we have to start advocating for is to help move some of this funding into this translation piece so that the technology can get to the people for whom it's, it was really truly intended. And then there are some also, also some amazing uh, cutting edge technologies today that are really inherently possible only in uh, a research setting. Um, I did a story about a young man in Columbus, Ohio, uh, who was uh, left quadriplegic by a swimming accident. Um, there's a technology that's actually uh, reconnecting his brain to his own hand to allow him to grasp objects, uh, to pick things up, and feed himself. But that required getting uh, brain surgery. It, it required uh, having uh, implants in his brain um, and he has to be, they have to be wired. Uh, it's not, you know, he, he can't just uh, 
uh, go anywhere with this. Um, so there are some, some still some serious technological limita limitations, especially when you talk about the neural implant side of things. But you touched on a really important thing. He's, he's a great individual too, but I call him one of our bionic pioneers because he's put his body forward to help move science forward. And when we think about clinical trials, and with a drug, we can do a clinical trial, you stop taking it, you go to your treatment that you had previously, right? With medical devices, it's a different relationship. So several people, such as the, the, the gentleman you're talking about, had an implant into his brain. He's giving up his body to, have, to move science forward. And what do we do? We have to have that ethical conversation of what do we do when that clinical trial's over with? If we were able to give him the ability to have the use of his hand during a clinical trial and then we take that away again, is that a, that's an ethical question I think we need to address when we talk about medical devices. Uh, we can take another question or two from the audience, I think. Uh, Laura, Laura Truman with the Heritage Foundation. Wanted to ask, uh, there's a direct public policy uh, relevance to uh, the Social Security Disability Insurance um, Program, and we all know that that is uh, in financial trouble. So has any study been done about what percentage of people who are on SSDI, based on you know, the allocations of the different um, muscular, skeletal, mental illness, et cetera, that this technology as it exists today could enable to work? I don't have, a, I don't have figures off the top of my head. Do you? There, the, um, the, the studies that I know that I'm aware of are the ones that look at this from a medical device standpoint. Um, and it's looking at it in terms of savings of healthcare costs. How can I, for instance, for, for um, diaphragm pacing, they did a long-term study of being able to move people, the consumers of those devices, from a nursing home to their home environment. When we look at doing the studies, taking them in their home environment to being able to be to, to work and get off of public assistance, I have, I'm not aware of any of the studies that are doing it, but it's definitely needed to be able to help make a case for this type of technology. Yeah, I would just say we tend to think in silos. Okay, money going out through the healthcare reimbursement programs, but then to think about money being saved through some of the assistance programs makes it an easier sell. Well, for us, the, the average age in our clinical study was 31 years of age. So you see people that are going to be around for a long time. Uh, and we've got an advantage, 10% of our employees are paralyzed. Uh, that helps us get our products right and helps us live our lives right. Um, I'd like to see this extended more to that type of study. And uh, one of the things the FDA did require, even though it doesn't entirely attach, is we are doing post-market studies of seeing how it's changing their patterns. So we are at least measuring at home, uh, and we put a lot of software into our system where we can measure steps, we can measure a lot of variables that the individual is using that we'll be able to collect and build some of that data. Um, the one other step beyond that, someone who wasn't working, who's back at work, I, we don't have, and uh, that's something we would like to have. Do we have time for one more? Did someone else have a question? Hi, it's Supriya Raman with the Department of Transportation. Uh, I have a question for you. How do you respond to people who talk about you perpetuating negative stereotypes of disability as something that needs to be eradicated? I think you're really touching on the whole diversity issue and how we need to, to, to think of ourselves as not just all able-bodied people, but how we interact with those with disabilities. Um, I, regardless of what he does in his private life, Oscar Pistorius really came over a barrier in the world of sport where he was able to have someone with a prosthetic limb compete against able-bodied people and that brings them together and it really opens up that whole conversation about how people with disabilities can interact and work together with people with that that are able-bodied and and i think that's integration of the society is something we really need to think about i think uh, you know you can almost use an example across society there uh, all types of people, and it's no different in the disability group. And uh, as I've gotten to work with uh, so many individuals, uh, there's no difference uh, relative to most of the things we're, we're doing and wanting in everyday life. Um, and I think you learn that. Uh, so you're going to see examples on all ends of the spectrum, whether you're able-bodied or, or have uh, something that is limiting you. 
Um, so maybe we can maybe we can conclude uh, with uh, a final thought that we didn't get to. Something that you would want people to take away from this conversation. Um, <laughs> this is there's a lot the there's a lot going on. yeah, Kutsi first. Oh. But um, I think there's a couple of key key points to think about. I think one is that the, the neurotechnology and the and the investment that we've made in in research and development is extremely exciting. And, um, and it's, 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 it's exhilarating to see and, and what we're doing to be able to, to uh, work with people with different types of neurological conditions to help overcome those conditions. I think we need to look at what our societal role is in terms of adapting and, and integrating that technology into people's lives as we learn more. How do we move it from the laboratory to the consumer? And being able to build that bridge is such an important piece for us. And I'll leave you with, with one last comment is that you know, the, the neurotechnologies that we have today, we need to think about how we bring those into being as normal as, as we do a cell phone. So think about this type of technology and how we integrate it into our lives. We think we can't live without our cell phones today. But think about how we can do that with all these other types of technologies to eradicate different types of disabilities. Right. And I'll relate to that. I, I get to work a little further upstream, so I get to see certain things that you dream about, and I'm getting to do them. And uh, it, it happened for a reason, though. And I, I come back to, we had a gentleman who's a quadriplegic who wanted to be able to provide others the ability to walk again. And he dedicated a decade or more of his life to that. And we're going to implement that now. Uh, and I, I think there's a message that we all have to be cognizant of is what is possible. Uh, it is possible for someone to, uh, Claire Lomas, to do a marathon in London. It is, uh, she's one of the early paraplegics that, that got this product. It is possible for one of our walkers to take her daughter out on, thanks, on uh, Halloween, get my uh, holidays right. Uh, so th the world will continue to advance. We're at the beginning, and uh, I do uh, look very much forward to what we can do, but also the combinations of other technologies. And if we can keep society aware of it's going to continue to advance, let's believe and, and look for this uh, down the road. Uh, we'll, uh, I'll, get, I'll keep implementing, you can keep inventing. That's the deal. <laughs> it was also possible for Jennifer to win a silver medal uh, in the Paralympics. Uh, that's right. Yeah, I, um, I actually used this technology not while I was competing, but um, actually to be able to get around the village and to be able to um, build up my strength so I was able to, to compete in that sport and the sport of sailing. So that yeah, was fun. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks, everyone, Thank for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.